Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Lee Ross. He is a professor of psychology at Stanford University and the co-founder of the Stanford Center on Conflict and Negotiation. He's been the recipient of several awards. He is the author of three influential books, Human Inference and the Person and the Situation, both with Richard Nisbet, and more recently, The Wisest One in the Room with Thomas Gilovich and many highly cited papers. His research on attributional biases and shortcomings in human inference has exerted a major impact in social psychology and the field of human inference, judgment, and decision-making. Among the phenomena he identified and has explored are the fundamental attribution error, the false consensus effect, the reactive devaluation, the hostile media phenomenon, and the convictions of naive realism. So, Dr. Ross, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so the first thing I would like to ask you about is the fundamental attribution error. So, what is it really about and uh, why does it occur? Well, uh, the fundamental attribution error refers to the fact that there's a, a fundamental task that we human beings do when we interact with each other, and that is we make judgments about cause. Why has someone behaved the way they do? And very often, the distinction we make are causes that have to do with the person. It might be their personality, uh, their education, something about them, uh, as opposed to something about the situation they're in. What are the influences on them? What are what compels them to behave in a particular way and what constrains them from behaving in uh, particular ways uh, at the moment that we observe them? And sometimes we can see and we know about those influences. Sometimes we don't. We just see behavior and we ask ourselves, why is that person doing that? Why is that mother yelling at the child? Why is that man giving money to charity, why is that other person uh, uh, so angry, things like that. And so that's a fundamental task, and I was referring to a particular error or bias that we see, particularly in Western society, which is very individualistic and it believes a lot in responsibility and that kind of thing, and that error is to uh, overlook the importance of the situation, even when we know it, to not give it enough weight, and when we don't know it, to not consider that the behavior we're observing, the actions or the outcomes, the successes or the failures, the things that make someone look good or make them look bad, may be caused by something about the situation they're in. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So, we think differently about our own actions and the actions of other people, right? So, for example, if I make a mistake, I most of the time try to attribute it to the situation. But when is another person making a mistake, then perhaps most of the time I'm compelled to attribute the problem to something that is dispositional, that is something uh, that is about the person itself and not about the situation, right? Well, that that certainly happens. Uh, my, my original formulation of the error said that we make this, we make these, or when we make this error, attributing it to the person, rather than the situation. That is the fundamental attribution error. We sometimes do it about ourselves. We sometimes blame ourselves when other people would have said it wasn't your fault. But in general, there's a tendency to make more situational attributions about our own behavior than other people's behavior, uh, primarily because we often know more about the context for our own behavior. We know more about those influences than we do about other people, the influences in other people. And we also know how we behave differently when the situation was different. 
and when we observe someone else, we don't have that full awareness of all the different times they've been in different situations and how they've acted in those situations. But yes, in general, there's a tendency uh, about the self to protect the self and to, we all are motivated to see ourselves as moral, uh, rational, uh, coherent, our behavior makes sense, it's consistent with who we are, and we are motivated to do that, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Not as by the way, we're not just motivated to make those judgments, we're also motivated to act that way, to act in ways that are consistent and that reflect well on us. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and what is the relationship between the fundamental attribution error and the just world phenomenon? That is, the idea that we have that people get what they deserve. Okay, well, there's a, two different kinds of answers. One is what's gone on in psychological research, and the other is where do we see it in the real world? So in terms of research, we have many, many famous studies that show how a subject people are to the influence of the situation that they're in and how su surprising that can be sometimes. In particular, how very small changes in the situation can produce big changes in behavior. So I think you know there's one famous study that looked at whether... Uh, uh, people studying to become Protestant ministers at a very famous theological institute at Princeton University were uh, on their way from one building to another to give a talk on the Good Samaritan parable and as they're walking they see a, or hear a man groaning and calling out for help from an aisle way and whether they stop or not is enormously influenced by whether they were told they had to get there as quickly as possible, whether they're in a rush or whether they have a lot of time on their hands. When they're in a rush, uh, they stop maybe 10 or 15 percent of the time. Uh, when they had a lot of time on their hands, they were more, much more likely than not to stop. So that's a story about the influence of a small situation. It's capturing the biblical parable, of course, about all the famous important people who don't stop to help the uh, the uh, uh, the victim. Uh, uh, it's a parable about that uh, uh, because the, the busy people are are the, the important people, the Pharisee and the uh, teachers. They're in a rush to do something important, and it's the humble. Samaritan, who was a member of this very low status group, who actually stops. So that was the point of that parable. In the experiment, uh, we see this effect, but also uh, the fundamental attribution error would be if you were told about the study and you were told this particular person didn't stop, you'd say, I don't think he'd be a suitable person to be the minister in my church. And if you didn't know about whether he was in a hurry or not, and you just knew that he hadn't stopped, you would assume something very bad or something quite good about him, and it would be wrong. And there's many, many studies like that. Some of them uh, go into the real world, so there's a very well-known study that looked at whether people in Europe are willing to agree to have their organs donated in case they are in a fatal traffic accident, and on your driver's license there's a place where you can indicate that in some countries we have what's called an opt-in procedure. You have to decide actively to put your name on a line that says, yes, you can use my organs. In some other countries, it's the opposite. It's assumed that your organs will be available, and they will be available unless you indicate you don't want them to be. So this seems like a very small thing. It's not very hard to sign your driver's license one way or the other. But it turns out that it has a huge effect in the many countries 
where you have to opt in, the rates are usually around 10 or 15 or at most 20 percent. In the places where you would have to opt out, 95 percent of people end up uh, not opting out, ending up making their organs be available. And then that's very dramatic because you look at countries and you compare, say, Sweden and Norway, which to all purposes seem like very simple, similar countries, but in Norway, 5% of people opt in. In Sweden, only 5% or 10% opt out. And uh, we see a similar difference between opt in Austria, opt in Germany, and opt out Austria. Again, in uh, Austria, 95% of people uh, make their organs available. In Germany, uh, only uh, 5 or 10% do so. So this is a real world demonstration of the power of a small situational factor. But again, if you didn't know better, if I just told you there's this country where 90% of people make their organs available, you'd say, oh, it must be a very uh, uh, a country with very good citizens who care about each other and want to look after each other. And if I told you it was only 5%, you'd assume a very different kind of country. And in both cases, you'd be making the fundamental attribution error. So in uh, everyday life, or, uh, it shows up very much so that we don't take adequate account of whether in life you've had advantages or disadvantages. We tend to think that people who succeed are virtuous and people who fail are not so virtuous. That's a heritage of our Protestant ethic uh, culture. Of course, it also relates to the fact that all things being equal, we want to think that the world is a fair and just place and that the virtuous people get rewarded and the people who don't get rewarded are not rewarded because they're not virtuous or they don't work hard enough. And we, in doing that, we underestimate the impact of, of situational advantages or uh, disadvantages, and sometimes even small ones. Things like, uh, did you happen to uh, be in the right place at the right time? Did you go on the job market in a good year or a bad year? Uh, and uh, it shows up most, of course, when we look at people who are disadvantaged because of their race or their social class, and we underestimate the way in which obvious barriers, but also some subtle ones, just the kinds of stereotypes that people have about them and the expectations and the way people interpret their behavior. We underestimate the impact of those. My colleague Tom Gilovich, who wrote the book with me, says we're sometimes uh, we're aware of all the headwinds we face, but we're not aware of the tailwinds. So we're, we're aware of the difficulties we overcome, but we forget about some of the advantages that we've had and we don't fully recognize the ways in which just good fortune, sometimes even good luck, have uh, given us opportunities and made us be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So you've already touched a little bit on this, but I would like to ask you anyways. So uh, the fundamental attribution error operates differently in different uh, cultures? Well, there is some research that suggests that people in uh, more collectivist cultures, the cultures particularly of Asia, China, Japan, Korea, of those countries, that people in those countries are more sensitive to situational pressures and constraints. In particular, they're more sensitive to social pressures and constraints in part because they're more attentive to them. There's more of a priority put on fulfilling expectations, doing what's expected of you, doing what's approved of, uh, than in Western cultures, particularly the United States. And in those cultures, 
people uh, actually show a more interesting bias, they tend to give to see their own behavior and the behavior of people who are in their group more charitably than the behavior of people who are not in their group. So they make more of a distinction not between me and everyone else, but between us and them. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So now let's move on to another big topic of your research, that is naive realism. What is it about? Well, uh, naive realism is not so much a theory as a simple fact, and that is as human beings, we tend to believe that there's a direct relationship between the way we see the world and the way the world is. The world we see has red apples and uh, uh, pleasant smells of cooking. Uh, it has warm days and cold days. It has loud sounds and soft sounds. It has beautiful music and and uh, horrible screechy sounds. That's the world we experience, and we talk about the world as having those properties. But of course, if we think about it more deeply, we realize that that's our perception because of the particular kind of stuff that we're made of, our particular sense organs. And uh, it doesn't matter that that notion that assuming that there's a one-to-one -one relationship, that we're seeing the world objectively in a accurate fashion, as long as we all see it the same way. And most of the time, for ordinary things, as I said, like, like uh, uh, red apples and, uh, and uh, Bach cantatas, we, we do perceive it the same way. But, of course, in a world where People have different experiences, different histories, different backgrounds, different values. They often see things differently. And when they see things differently, they ask themselves, what's wrong with the other person? Why don't they see the world the way it really is? But this isn't just about conflict. It's about a lot of everyday experiences. At the most basic level, we all have certain illusions. So when you sit down in a chair, you have the feeling, the illusion that the chair was solid and that your seat, your rear end was solid and you sat down and two solid things made contact. If you were to talk to a physicist, he'd say, no, actually, you never actually made contact with the chair. The uh, field of negatively charged particles around you and the field around the negatively charged particles particles on the chair were repelling each other, then actually you were hovering over the chair at a hundred millionth of a centimeter above the chair. And in fact, if it weren't for those fields, you'd fall right through the chair and you'd fall right through the floor because contrary to your impressions, most matter is made up of tiny amounts of matter and large amounts of space around the matter. Uh, so we have that kind of dramatic uh, way in which, uh, of course, uh, our perceptions of the world differ from the world. But in everyday experiences, we see it all the time. We see elderly couples arguing, or at least one couple says the room is too hot. The other member of the couple says the room is too cold. And they may argue about it, or if they're nice, one will adjust the thermostat to serve the other. But they'll do it believing there's something wrong with the other person. They'll say, well, my wife is someone who's always cold, so I had to bear a room that was too hot. Or a woman will say, well, my husband is kind of deaf, so I had to put the TV up very loud. Whereas he says, ah, now the TV's on appropriately. And why does everyone around me whisper when they should be talking clearly? So we have these experiences all the time. Uh, even the experience of what's easy and what's difficult. So I'm frustrated that my uh, teenage son doesn't know any history. How can they know so little about what's gone on in the world? 
Uh, on the other hand, they look at me and they say, how can dad be so incompetent with the computer? He doesn't even know, he doesn't even know how to turn on Skype. <laughs> and, we, and we think it's that our perception of what's easy and hard is right. And that people who can do things that we find difficult are very skilled. And people who can't do the things that we find easy are deficient in some ways. So this goes on all the time. But the most sinister implications of it do come in the context of conflict, where people disagree about matters of politics or matters of religion. Uh, so in America, we see a pretty deep political divide now between so-called nationalists or ultra-nationalists and who are conservative and, and uh, progressive liberals, and each side thinks that the other side is seeing the world the way they do because it's, their view is distorted, distorted by biased media or self-interest. Uh, and uh, both groups are actually usually shocked to find out that the other group thinks that they're the ones that are biased. So uh, liberal voters like me, when, when we do research, we're shocked to find out that Trump voters think that they're the ones who are more compassionate than the liberals. And they're the ones who are, are realistic and uh, are taking history into account. And it's the liberals who are deluded. They also think that they're warm and we're cold. Whereas, of course, we have the opposite view. And they would be very shocked to find out that we don't agree that they're the patriots and we're the ones who are disloyal. They'd be very unhappy, and they are very unhappy when we claim we're the patriots and they're the ones who are dishonoring the history of our country. So we see these kinds of displays uh, all the time. Uh, it also leads us to have a jaundiced view of the media. So when the media report, uh, when they do what they always do, they have someone from one side talking and then someone from the other side uh, talking. We're very unhappy. We say, how could they give equal time and weight to those scandalous people on the other side of the political spectrum? They, they, they didn't point out that they're lying and our spokesman was telling the truth. And, and that's why very often uh, we see liberals and conservatives disagree where liberals claim the media is biased against them. It, represents the business interest to control the media, and conservatives think the media is controlled by liberal elites. So we we have that impression. Mm -hmm. And if I yeah. may say so... Yes, this, please go ahead. Yeah. This illusion of objectivity has lots of other uh, effects as well. It makes us not give enough weight to the opinions of people that disagree with us. We want to talk to and we accept as wise people who agree with us, and we think that people who disagree with us must be wrong. And so we've done studies that show even when people are making estimates about ordinary things, what percentage of people have a particular, read a particular newspaper, or uh, 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 how, how likely it is that uh, a particular party will win the election, or how likely it is that uh, that a woman will will uh, fly in space or anything like that. People tend to give their own judgment more weight than the other person's judgment, and in lots of studies we're able to show that they pay a price for doing so. That if two people average their guesses, they're better off on average than either of their guesses alone. And even when we tell them that some, someone else's guess and we let them decide how much weight to give that guess, they typically give it too little weight in our studies. About a third of the time, they give it no weight at all. And they pay a price in terms of accuracy for doing so. So one of the implications is that we underutilize a very valuable resource 
and that's disagreement. And we underutilize it most when it would be most valuable, when other people disagree with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you already talked a little bit about politics and how the liberals think the conservatives are always wrong and vice versa. And even nowadays, a little bit throughout the entire world, we have this very big schism between the right and the left, let's say. So, um, and I'm trying to connect with another phenomenon that you've studied, that is uh, reactive devaluation. So let's say that two different political factions accept to together, together and to try to solve their issues. But one thing that happens frequently is that if one of the parties puts forward a solution or proposes a solution, then the other party usually, because that solution came from the opposite party, they tend to devaluate it, right? Yes. Well, there's a little bit of a connection to naive realism here uh, in the sense that uh, in those situations when people negotiate and, and some third party makes a proposal, each side thinks that the other side is giving up too little and they're having to give up too much, that the other side is not giving up anything that they were ever entitled to have and that their side is being asked to make really profound and difficult compromises. So that's one of the reasons why uh, negotiations sometimes are difficult to to make uh, successful in contexts where there's real enmity, where there's real disagreement. But there's a phenomena over and above that, and that is when an offer is actually put on the table, we usually focus on what we're losing more than on what we're gaining. And uh, the work of psychologists uh, Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman, who studied the phenomena that they call loss aversion, point this out, that we weigh losses more heavily than gains. And so as soon as a proposal is put on the table, actually, no matter who puts it on the table, this happens. But even more, when it comes from the other side, we tend to think that an, uh, a proposal that might otherwise have looked pretty good suddenly looks less good when it's put on the table, as a, again, especially when it's put there by the other side, because we, as I said, focus much more on what we're giving up uh, than on what we're getting. And so uh, in lots of circumstances, agreements don't get made that would have been better for both parties. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, and so I would like to ask you, what would be some of the best ways uh, that, you, you'd, that you would propose for people to adopt, particularly in terms of communication, when they're trying to bridge the gap between opposing political parties or even any other sort of human groups, uh, and they're trying to arrive at a solution to a problem? To, to try to avoid reactive devaluation and other problems that people have when, when dealing with proposals from an opposing group? Okay, well, let me say first that there's some things you can't avoid. You can't not be subject to the illusion of objectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit like if you see a stick in water and it appears to be bent, you can't not perceive the stick is bent, but you can take the stick out of the water <coughs> and see that it's straight. And having had that experience a lot, even when you see it is bent, you can't not see it is bent, but you can know that you're subject to this particular illusion. So knowing about the objectivity illusion doesn't make you not experience it, but it can make you aware, and it can make you, uh, for one thing, 
realize that you shouldn't make a quick judgment. You should stop and engage in more deliberative thinking, not just trust your initial instinct. You might ask yourself, you might try hard to say, I wonder why that person feels that way. I wonder why that person's acting that way. Uh, what can't I see? What don't I know? And if you're really open-minded, you might also go so far as to say, and why am I seeing it the way that I did? What about my education or my experience or my circumstances in life are making me see things uh, the way that I do? So uh, that can be useful. Uh, in conflict uh, situations, uh, the work that I've been involved in, in uh, uh, mediation and helping parties uh, have better group dialogues, uh, we use some particular techniques. Uh, so in work in Ireland, we learned from people who do this work there that they have a process where they ask people on both sides, what do you want? And they say, first, what do you want in the way of a political disagreement? And everyone disagrees very much. In this case, the uh, the unionists and the, the national the and the uh, nationalists, the people who want a separate Irish Republic and the people who want to stay connected to Britain, they disagree very much. We can say that about Brexit, about that disagreement. Uh, but then when we ask them what they want their neighborhood, their communities to look like, they start sounding more similar. And when we ask them what they want their own lives and the lives of their family to look out, look like, they say very similar things. So sometimes having the kind of dialogue where people talk about their lives and their needs, their hopes and their fears, instead of just talking about their political positions, that can be valuable. The agreement still exists, but they don't, they don't see the disagreement as evidence that there's something terrible about the other person. They come to understand it as an inevitable result. So I remember very much uh, a meeting with the uh, Israeli prime minister who said to me, this was Yitzhak Rabin, that if he were a Palestinian, he would have been a terrorist. He didn't say it would have been the right thing to do. He still thought that those people were deluded and wrong, but at least he was willing to say, if I had been subject to the same influences that they were, I would have been a terrorist. He didn't go so far as to say, and maybe I have the views that I do because of what was unique about my experience. He still thought he was seeing things accurately, but, but he recognized this. Another technique, a little more uh, unusual, is that we, in the, we sometimes have groups, again, we've done this in Ireland, and we've done it in the Middle East with Palestinians and Israelis, or even people on opposite sides of politics, like activists and uh, uh, people who are satisfied with the status quo. <clears throat> We tell them that your job, before we start discussing things in detail, is you have to present the views of the other side to their satisfaction. So normally people start out presenting a caricature, a very extreme, oversimplified, kind of stupid view of the other side's position. And the other side, of course, says, no, that's not our position. Keep trying. And if they keep trying very hard, and they finally are able to describe the other side's position in a way that makes sense and actually captures the other side's position, then you're ready to have a better dialogue because you're responding to what's real, at least not to this illusion. And beside that, you appreciate the effort that the other person's making, you respect their intelligence, and uh, more, you trust them a little bit more, and also, this time, the fundamental attribution error actually helps a little bit. There's something about seeing someone say exactly what you believe 
that makes you say, well, <laughs> that person isn't so bad after all. Look, he's saying all these good things, even though we know he's saying them because his job was to present my position, not his. So there are some things uh, that we learn to do that are useful. Mm -hmm. Uh, would another thing that might work when trying to communicate with an opposing party or an opposing group of people, uh, would it be perhaps to try to uh, put the emphasis on some of the fundamental values that we might share with them instead of trying to make a case directly for our side? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. In American politics, we see this liberal conservative split. But of course, if we were to step back, we'd say they all be they all believe in having a democratic society. They all believe in having the rule of law. They all believe that citizens have a duty to uh, try and make the country better. They all believe that people who are in the most difficult circumstances deserve assistance. They might disagree about what kind of assistance is best and what's too much or too little, but they do have fundamental agreements. They agree about the fact that there should be a free press. They agree on the First Amendment. Sometimes they even agree on things that if you're an outsider, you find surprising. So I'm a Canadian by birth. And so when I see liberals and conservatives both agree about the Second Amendment, about the right to have guns, I think they're all crazy. <laughs> I said, well, you want to you wanna see less murder? Take guns away from people. And both liberals and conservatives say, no, 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 we don't want to do that. <laughs> But they agree with each other. And I think that would be true in almost any country we look at. And they also value other things. Uh, in most European countries, they have shared tastes in food, shared tastes in music, shared historical memories. And so the more you make people aware of what they share, the more it makes them ask exactly why does the person disagree about other things when that person is like me in lots of ways. It's interesting, one of the things we sometimes do is have people from different conflicts be together. So we've had uh, Israelis and Palestinians and also had Irish Protestants and Irish Catholics. And so the the uh, Israeli Jews and the uh, Palestinians look at these Irish guys and they shake their head. They say, how can they be arguing? They're exactly the same. They all like the same things. They all want to take a break in the morning to uh, have a to have a, a cup of, of, of uh, ale uh, of language the same way they sound the same they have the same accent they can't believe that these people can't get along and similar the Irish people seeing the as the Jews and the Palestinians and they all like falafel and uh, They like a lot of the same uh, music and they have a shared history. And the Irish people say, well, we understand why we can't get along, but why can't they get along? And that's a common experience. If you're an outsider, the conflicts that are going on within societies seem very strange to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So, Dr. Ross, just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best resources for them to get in touch with your work, either online resources or something outside the Internet as well? Oh, nowadays, in the, in the world of the Internet, if you just Google Lee Ross, psychologist, you'll learn more than you want to learn about me and the research I've done. Uh, I've also have some books that are available. I'll hold one up. Uh, this is the wisest one in the room. And this describes uh, what it is that people 
who we think are wise know what lessons they think they've learned and un what they understand and how they behave differently and uh, the ways in which a fairly deep understanding of both the way people think and the things that lead them to make errors, an understanding of those can make you wiser and more successful. So that book is available in lots of different languages, in English, but on other languages as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So, Dr. Ross, I would l really like to thank you for your patience because this is the second time we're trying to record the interview. The first attempt failed, so I'm really grateful for that. And uh, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it was a pleasure. We can regard the first interview as a dress rehearsal for this. <laughs> okay, okay, very well. Okay, so thank you again for your time. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.